A very good morning to you all. I'm uh, pleased to welcome you to this, the second joint seminar organized by the IIEA, the Commission on the Defence Forces, and the Royal Irish Academy's Standing Committee on International Affairs. We're delighted to be joined today by our expert panel of Dr. Raluca Cernatoni, Lieutenant General Tim Keating, Dr. Ulrike Franke, and Professor Greg Kennedy, who have been generous enough to take time out of their respective schedules to speak with us today. Each of our guests will be speaking to us for about eight to 10 minutes, and we will then go to Q&A and discussion. I would ask you carefully to note that the prepared remarks of each of our speakers this morning are on the record and are being live streamed via YouTube. The live stream, however, will end as we move to the Q&A session, which will be held under Chatham House rules. You're all warmly invited to uh, join our discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in at any time over the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once the panelists have made their opening remarks. If you're so minded, you can also join us on Twitter uh, using the handle at IIEA. I don't think we're quite into Instagram or TikTok territory just yet, but give us time, that will come too. Before I formally introduce our speakers, however, I'd like to pass the floor to Aidan O'Driscoll, who is the chair of the Commission on the Defence Forces, for his opening remarks. Over to you, Aidan. Uh, thank you, Ben, uh, and uh, welcome to everybody to, to this uh, webinar. I'm sure it'll have a wide and attentive audience within the small uh, defence community in, in this country. We hope that through the work of the Commission and by hosting these webinars, uh, we will expand that community somewhat and get a, a better and wider and deeper debate on defence and security matters in this country. And we all know that we have uh, quite a long way to go uh, in that respect. I want to thank uh, the IEA and in particular Clodagh Quain and her colleagues uh, for organizing this event, along with the RIA who hosted our previous seminar uh, in, in April. Of course, I want to uh, thank, wish, thank our, our distinguished uh, speakers today uh, for contributing their time and their enormous expertise uh, to our, bet our effort to, to better inform the debate in, in this country. Uh, and Ben has already introduced them. And of course, I should thank Ben himself uh, a distinguished professor from UCD who has been a strong and well-informed contributor to security and defence debates in this country, which is a fairly rare thing. Uh, and also to thank Andrew Cotty of UCC who hosted our previous uh, seminar. I won't take up too much of your time talking about the work of the Commission, but I did want to make a few points. Uh, as this audience will know, the Commission has been asked to look at the uh, defence forces of the future, in particular to look at the structures, staffing and capabilities that our defence forces require in the immediate future into 2030 and beyond. So uh, we are future focused, but we start from a realistic uh, understanding of where we are at the moment. Since we commenced our work, um, I want to take this opportunity to say that we've had a great deal of very useful engagement with, as you would expect, senior staff in the defence forces and the Department of Defence, um, but also with staff in NATO, in the UN, in the EU's External Action Service, in the European Defence Agency. We've spoken to the representative associations of uh, Defence Force staff, both current and retired. Um, we've also undertaken a public consultation and received around 500 very well considered submissions. Uh, so that's been key. And we've talked to a lot of key state agencies. Because of course, uh, today we understand that security is very often a whole of government and even a whole of society concern rather than just a defense force concern. One thing I do want to say is that we've now visited almost all barracks and bases uh, around the country and met women and men from the front line, uh, all ranks, all three services, uh, and I can say that our report will be deeply marked by uh, what we heard on those visits. And I want to take uh, the opportunity to genuinely thank everyone we met, all the soldiers, sailors, air crew that we met for what was a very open, honest, frank engagement with the Commission. It's really been tremendous. And I also want to thank all those people who made those well-considered uh, submissions to our public consultation. We will write our report. We hope we will have it on time for the end of the year. It'll be a lot of work. I, I want to warn people again, we won't cover every single issue that has been raised with us. It would just be impossible. Um, but we think we will produce a report uh, that we hope will be uh, important and challenging in some important ways. 
Uh, I must, uh, of course, remind everybody, we will make recommendations. It is the government that will uh, make the decisions. I do want to make just a couple of points that are relevant to the seminar. I don't want to take up too much time, uh, but if Ben will indulge me, uh, just a few general points. First, on the time frame, 2030 and beyond, this is important for the seminar, but it's also important for the work of the Commission. Um, the security environment, as we all know, is changing um, rapidly and sometimes in very unpredictable ways. Uh, and many of the threats that we face today require, as I've said, a whole of society response. And a modern defense force must be capable of contributing in a genuinely flexible, uh, responsive way to that changing threat environment and be able to work with other state agencies and indeed private entities uh, in doing so. So the defense forces cannot be an island. Um, they need to learn from others and teach others uh, within that whole of society framework in order to be fit for the kind of complex and hybrid threats we face today. And I think that's a, a really quite important point. So the defense forces need to be specifically configured to be efficient and flexible uh, to meet those unpredictable needs of these times. And that flexibility needs to be built into its structure with clear lines of command, the avoidance of service silos and strong external relations with other key agencies. Um, well, the Defence Force is not an island. Ireland is an island um, in the North Atlantic um, with high ambitions for our own defence as a neutral country. But we also have specific responsibilities as a good neighbour and as a committed member of the European Union and the United Nations. Our location delivers obvious uh, benefits to us from a security perspective, but it also poses some potential challenges and certainly comes with responsibilities for a large and sensitive maritime and air domain. We need to address these responsibilities honestly, with a clear and unambiguous link between our defense policy, our level of ambition, and our military capabilities across all domains. And I hope that the Commission can contribute to setting the framework for such a policy debate, while not ourselves getting into a policy discussion which would be outside our terms of reference. I expect we'll hear something from our panelists today on new technologies, both in terms of the opportunities they present and, and the threats they also pose. And I'm afraid I'm one of those people who's been a bit seduced by the whole technology thing. Myself, and I keep banging on to my colleagues about drones and UAVs and all this. Um, and of course, everybody in Ireland has become a cybersecurity expert since the attack on our, on our health system. And Cyber seems to me to pose an interesting case in point for the point that, that we really face a whole of society security challenge and points to the need to develop strong new capabilities within our defense forces, but within a clear national framework, which we hope is provided in our national cyber security strategy. Finally, major point that defense like everything else ultimately comes down to people. Uh, and in our visits to barracks around the country, uh, I want to say the Commission have been genuinely hugely impressed by the quality uh, of the women and men that we met, the relatively few women and many men we met. Uh, the people in our defence forces are, are genuinely great. However, we have been struck by the number and range of issues that have been raised with us in relation to the management of people and culture within the defence forces. We'll have a good deal to say about this. And uh, I believe that our proposals will uh, amount to a significant agenda for change and renewal to strengthen and modernize our defense forces in a way worthy of the people we met. And maybe just as importantly, of those who in the future may be attracted to join a modern, diverse and engaged organization. Final, final point, Ben, uh, any, any program of change in a well-established organization brings with it significant implementation challenges, and personally, I have some experience of that. Uh, but of course, the path that we are going to be traveling with the Irish Defence Forces has also been traversed by some other Defence Forces, and indeed by other organizations outside the Defence space. So I think mutual learning will be very, very important here. We can learn from others, others can learn from us. And I hope that uh, what we hear today uh, will we'll contribute to that learning process and certainly the quality of the panel that has been assembled 
suggests that we can have high expectations in that regard. There are my few remarks, but Ben, thank you very much. And good luck with the rest of the discussions. Thanks very much, Aidan. And uh, speaking to someone from, from the outside, I mean, it, it has been remarkable to see yourself, your staff colleagues and your fellow commissioners uh, working so hard to do that kind of bottom-up process of listening uh, in the Defence Forces and doing, as, I, as I've seen, a hell of a lot of travelling uh, in the meantime and in, and in some extraordinary circumstances. Uh, please allow me now to, to formally introduce our speakers uh, in order of presentation. Uh, first, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Luca Cervatoni, who is a guest professor at the Institute for European Studies at the Free University of Brussels, the VUB. She's also a visiting scholar at uh, Carnegie Europe, where she works on European security and defence, with a specific focus on disruptive technologies, which again, in an Irish context, is, is of particular interest. Second, we have uh, Lieutenant General Tim Keating, retired, who served as Chief of the New Zealand Defence Force from 2014 to 2018, where in addition to his many operational responsibilities, he also steered the development of a 10-year strategy for a more integrated defence force for New Zealand. New Zealand. Uh, next, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Ulrike Frank, who is a Senior Policy Fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, where she leads ECFR's Technology and European Power Initiative. She's also a specialist on European security and defence and on the future of warfare. And finally, please welcome Professor Greg Kennedy, who's Professor of Strategic Foreign Policy at King's College London. He's also an adjunct professor at the Royal Military College of Canada in the History and War Studies departments. His research centers on strategic foreign policy issues, maritime defense and disarmament. You're all very, very welcome. We're delighted to have you. Uh, and I'm very pleased to hand the floor over now to Dr. Senator Tony for uh, her formal remarks. Raluca, please. Thank you very much, Ben, and thank you to the Institute of International and European Affairs, to the Royal uh, Irish Academy Standing Committee on International Affairs, and the Commission on the Defence Forces for the um, kind invitation. I'm delighted to join this distinguished panel of speakers. So for today's talk, I was asked to cover quite a broad range of topics from emerging disruptive technologies, the future of defence, and the European context. And I'm sure that my 10 minutes will not give them justice, but uh, I will give it a try for sure. Uh, so when I uh, started to prepare, prepare some uh, thoughts last night uh, for today's discussion, I remembered the classic book of American futurologist Alvin Toffler. Uh, it's called very, it, it has a very hyped title, The Future Shock or Future Shock. Um, and um, a thought struck me. Uh, while uh, many of his predictions did not materialize and some did, uh, he got, I think, one thing right. Um, we indeed live in uh, times where um, we are experiencing future shock, especially due to technological advancements. And this is also true for international, European and national security. Um, so two things are sure, uh, especially when it comes to dealing with this future shock. Technology is power and information is power. So nowadays we are definitely witnessing unprecedented improvements in artificial intelligence and autonomous technologies. Of course, drones are emerging technologies and I think Ulrike will give, uh, give us some thoughts on this. Um, but uh, definitely, uh, especially artificial intelligence and all the discussions surrounding it, all the strategic and policy initiatives uh, from uh, other international organizations, uh, the European Union or, um, or, 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 or states for that matter, are uh, definitely currently fueling a so-called geopolitical, um, you know, uh, new great power competition, especially between the US and China. Uh, future and disruptive technologies or emerging technologies, or however you want to call them, uh, future disruptive defense technologies um, are being called by the European Union and especially the European Commission are now prioritizing national strategies, um, again, in terms of investment in innovation, research and development. Um, when it comes to the European Union, uh, I would like to flag maybe one initiative that is quite interesting, and of course you are uh, well familiarized with it, it's the European uh, Defense Fund, where you, you see this uh, label of future disruptive defense technologies. Um, and uh, in the European Defense Fund, of course, um, the innovation, the research and development and the application and deployment of such technologies is prioritized, especially in European security and defense context. 
So um, uh, emerging technologies, new technologies have taken again a center stage on the US um, security and defense agenda. This is also reflected in increased efforts to enhance the US strategic autonomy, technological and digital sovereignty, data sovereignty, as well as proactively investing in so-called yet again made in Europe or European artificial intelligence. The swift, uh, in my opinion, operationalizations of such initiatives like the European Defense Fund, uh, coupled with other initiatives at the EU level to invest in civil military uh, research and development, uh, their cross fertilization um, are definitely um, areas that have gained a strategic importance. Uh, while civilian innovation was not that important, let's say, on the strategic uh, foreign policy agenda, as well as international security, uh, um, and internal security priorities when it comes to the European Union, there is an increasing trend in recent years to see technology as a source of power, especially as a source of European power. Uh, to this end, the European Commission's action plan on synergies between civil, defense, and space industries from February 2021 um, puts ahead some key, um, uh, key steps to achieve technological sovereignty or a digital sovereignty for that matter. And um, this is a proposal to advance a more cross-domain approach to uh, prioritize dual use technologies, to again uh, lay emphasis on synergies between civil and military innovation, but also um, uh, overall uh, to um, enhance European uh, strategic autonomy when it comes to key uh, new and emerging technologies. NATO allies, for that matter, also have um, agreed to launch a new civil military defense innovation accelerator for the North Atlantic. Um, some have said that it's similar to the European Defense Fund. Uh, the NATO initiatives uh, is, is called Diana under the Greek uh, uh, hunt, uh, hunting goddess, but um, one of the main goals of, uh, of these initiatives is exactly to boost transatlantic cooperation on critical dual use technologies, promote interoperability and yet again harness civilian innovation spin-ins and engage proactively with uh, the public sector, with academia, but as well as, of course, uh, startups. So the goal is um, to maintain NATO's edge in seven key disruptive technologies such as artificial intelligence, data and computing, um, autonomous uh, technologies, quantum enabled technologies, biotechnology, hypersonic technology, and space. And this is the, sa the same goes, of course, for the EU when it comes especially to space, um, but also cybersecurity. But what does um, this all mean for military transformation? Uh, I think that the above uh, initiatives revolve around managing the shock of technological disruption. They also show for, for from uh, again, um, uh, 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 looking at all these initiatives, they also show that both the EU and NATO have taken significant steps in recent years to adapt and adopt new technologies more quickly strengthen the defense technological and industrial base and bridge innovation gaps. But the clear message here is that developing the defense technology, uh, defense industry and technology base in Europe is key to strategic autonomy and interoperability in the uh, transatlantic context. Um, to be a, to put on a, a little bit of more of a critical hat, <laughs> they also show an emphasis on techno solutionism and technological superiority in military affairs. Uh, but this is, of course, not a new development uh, for students of uh, revolutions in military affairs or strategic studies uh, scholars. Uh, this belief in techno solutionism um, and that cutting edge technological innovation can become a silver bullet to solve complex national, international security and defense problems um, or uh, provide a strategic operational tactical edge during times of com a conflict is nothing new and it can take back, uh, trace back to the Roman Empire and even I think further on. But without any doubt in the 2030s and 2040s, <laughs> 
current accelerating technological trends will have profound consequences on strategic thinking, on security and defense policies, on deterrence capacity, balance of power, and most importantly, power projection. However, it is also very important to reflect on the type of technologies and data uh, that is being used, how useful it is uh, in the physical and in the non-physical combat environments of the future. So most importantly, I would remark that technological innovation alone rarely shapes military innovation. Instead, how militaries use technologies makes a difference, actually, uh, um, as well as how open organizational cultures are to tech and bureaucratic innovation. Uh, again, this is not uh, something new, and uh, this, uh, my opinion, is reflected in uh, academic scholarship and also uh, policy analysis on, on this matter. I also believe that emerging technologies create, especially uh, artificial intelligence, but I will not go into details about that, will create military strategic dilemmas at the heart of defense ecosystems that will definitely impact a deeply automated, digital, complex, and highly dynamic both physical and non-physical uh, battle space of the future. So in this respect, more thinking, I think, should be done uh, at both national, European, or international level uh, concerning such applications, uh, drawing red lines, uh, potential consequences of their applications and uses. But uh, in my opinion, at this stage, we are in an emerging state of thinking as well when it comes to emerging technologies. Um, and uh, conceptual uncertainty and strategic uncertainty surrounds many of uh, such technologies because they are emerging, they are new, as well as their potential disruptive effects or how they will disrupt, uh, disrupt organizational color, uh, cultures um, um, in, the, um, uh, in the defense structures. So, I think that um, another area that should be reflected in, uh, uh, on is indeed this more um, uh, holistic or whole of a society approach and approaching the defense for more of a broader uh, dimension such as security and also reflecting more deeply on, um, for instance, human machine teaming and also the ways in which, for instance, the militaries of the future will need to adapt to and use and be used at the same time by uh, these new and emerging technologies. So again, to state the obvious, and I will finish here, I think that my time is up. Um, and um, uh, to quote a military historian, Max Boot, um, military innovation since the 16th century onwards um, has shown that technology is just one side of the story <laughs> and it only sets the parameters of the possible. And uh, that is also true for the 2030s or the 2040s and the future of defense forces. So thank you very much and uh, looking forward to the q and I'm handing it over to Ben, I think. Well, Luca, thank you, thank you so much indeed. Indeed, you know the, the search for a silver bullet is is always is always a quest of policymakers that never exists. But technology, as you say, opens up many, many new and fascinating horizons. Uh, we turn now to to Tim Keating, who's going to give us sort of a more practitioner's perspective uh, as the man in the driving seat of New Zealand defence policy for for several years. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, Kira from a New Zealander, and Al Salam Alikum from somebody who's a resident of the Middle East currently. Um, my brief is focus on lessons learned and look um, I don't want to stand up and take my shirt off to talk about the scars of transforming a defense force so instead I'm going to give my my argument and talk about the scars verbally you know because throughout my career I've observed the successes and failures of senior leaders and their endeavors to significantly change military organizations or other organizations I went into health for a while or later as the vernacular became um, to transform them so my observations here about changing defense as an institution overall. In this, I'm gonna uh, reflect on my limited successes and more importantly, on my failures to achieve the changes that I'd envisioned at the levels at which I commanded my forces. Um, add to this, in my current role um, as a, a consultant, uh, this is what we do. We, we go into organizations like defense organizations and look at that model, that total operating model of the defense force. So I'm going to focus my remarks today at institutional level. The overriding lesson I want to get out of this today and pass across is what presents as a great idea of vision is only a start point in a long and often challenging process. 
and very few leaders actually achieve what they envision their organizations to be. Unfortunately, in many cases at the very outset, a poor vision does not provide the required simplicity, the motivation or the organization to enable the enterprise to be successful on its journey. Therefore, when examining these efforts and comparing them uh, to other organizations, both in New Zealand and internationally, there are some observations I'll make that I consider contributed to the success or failure of good transformations. Now, in this examination, I could be accused of stating truisms or repeating the rules of previous more, uh, more skilled observers than me, like John Cotter. However, what I find remarkable is despite the abundance of wise advice on change and transformation that exists and the wealth of lessons learned, it seems to me in the haste to improve our organization's performance or respond to a change in circumstances, little heed is paid to the foundations of organizational change. Organization leaders seem to become blinded early uh, or ease into easy solutions shiny new uh, capabilities like the techno solutionism we just heard about that promise impressive outcomes and in the haste to get things done rather than investing the necessary time and understanding of the overall opportunity that is presented to make their organizations what they truly need to be not what they want them to be and developing a clear path to how to get there and the military would call it a military 01, you know, where do you want to go and develop a plan to get there? But when we get organizationally, we tend to forget about some of those fundamentals. To me, all three elements of vision, design and execution must be given equal diligence by those who are leading and therefore accountable for the change. Another way of putting it in my business at the moment is getting the strategic alignment right, your program management right, and do not forget about the change management. Those three components must be given um, equal emphasis. Now, one could put the blame on the current social and political session, uh, uh, sorry, um, setting that prefers short-term gratification, results today rather than generational investment. But we cannot always use that as an excuse. Unless the change for model is comprehensive, and in the very worst cases, poor, poorly envisioned and executed transformations actually leave organizations, I've seen this time and time again, worse off with an incoherent operating model. So the brief for this seminar, on what constitutes an optimum for structure, for small militaries, capability and staffing, is of course the sort of midpoint of the transformative thinking. Look, there are many good analytical tools for this purpose, which can assist decision makers to make good evidence-based and inform decisions that turn policy into affordable military capabilities. And in doing so, understand the risk-based trade-off choices that provide the nation with the most utility, as we have heard already, in an uncertain future security environment. One that's full of surprises, black swans, or whatever you want to call them. For example, the size of your land force will be determined by the sum of the scale and duration of the events you want your land forces to succeed in and then trading off these events between the most likely and most dangerous, a simple, uh, a simple tool. Multi-criteria decision analysis was used heavily by us to take out the biases and those strong leaders who argued for certain views. In all of this equation, affordability must be considered over the lifetime of capability in all its elements, not just at today's shelf price. Of course, the aim overall is to achieve the trinity match of policy, capability, and affordability for the nation. So we were challenged with this task in New Zealand after, and I'll admit, a series of poor historical capability choices. And we completed this task under intense government scrutiny. In fact, it was more likely uh, with our feet to the flame, along with government and treasury, uh, to not repeat the mistakes of the past. As a result of following a disciplined process, I believe we produced an optimum force structure for the necessary capabilities for our context of what the nation could afford to spend on defence. And the government of the day actually considered the tools we applied to this process um, and the outcome as an exemplar of how you could look across a number of government departments. So the point I want to emphasize again to you today is you're presented with a once in a generation opportunity to rethink the plan and deliver true organizational transformation around forces. And in doing so, 
that vision and that plan must be fit for purpose for Ireland's future and its execution has to be comprehensive and part of a long-term strategy-led approach to transformation. Today, as the brief, I'm not going to talk to you about policy, but neither am I going to cover those tools that we used, and that could be used for another day. Instead, I'm going to talk about those fundamental lessons in the execution phase. And again, as I say before, I'm going to risk restating a few truisms or getting into semantic gym, gym, uh, gymnastics on transformation speak. However, I consider the purpose of what, why you're undertaking change and subsequently leading that change is vital in leading a military transformation or any organizational transformation. And time and time again, it's given lip service. Yeah, we know all that, but we'll still go on and do the changes necessary. And why most transformations continue to fail. So if you think gaining consensus, and believe me in the military, that's where the scars come from, on the vision and the path towards that vision is tough, then you have to be aware that change execution is tougher. And the strategy, the plan this, for this must be as comprehensive as the effort you put into determining your vision, your future capabilities, and your associated force structure. So let me, let me just cl clarify a point of semantics here. I refer to transformation as a pivot point, something you can't have enduring, which describes a fundamental shift to a new model. And in my mind, this normally affects significant changes in all the foundations of your operating model, including the governance, and that's command and control as well for the military, personnel, processes, and technology. You can't have a sort of a part transformation of an organization without seeing its effect across those pillars. When I was tasked by the frustration of the New Zealand government, as I said before, who had some for some years sought to develop a more coherent uh, whole of defense force model, to undertake a major transformation of New Zealand, I chose to undertake the organizational transformation before later moving to business transformation part, the capabilities part. My observations, having observed it in lower ranks and around the executive table and before I came to the uh, Chief of Defence Force, was the organizational brain required drastic surgery before the optimization of capabilities and functions could even be envisioned let alone change as part of your total operating concept. The tribalism that exists in many military organizations clouds rational, future-enabled thought. The ability to think beyond individual interests to a common purpose. Military DNA is fundamentally conservative. We like fighting last wars. We like dealing with what, what we're certain with. One of the greatest risks to any transformation are leaders who remain wedded to past models. Of course, this is the why many organizations bring external people like we have with this panel to help us break some of that thinking and drive the necessary change. And I use this as well extensively for my own defense force, as well as a motivation for them to become intellectually engaged with the future rather than just guarding the past. So I used uh, uh, panels like this, but also built a coalition of people within the organization and outside the organization, including consultancy services to help with the plan. Building that coalition of energized leaders within and external to the organization of where I spent a lot of my effort. You know, I've actually felt, again, this might be a, a, sound a little bit trite, but the intellectual part of it was relatively straightforward to what type of capabilities. But bringing that coalition of people forward, both externally and internally, to actually action that change is where the leader must place most of their energy. So we know and we've heard already that in today's environment, there are multiple influences that impact a military organization simultaneously and they're coming at us rapidly. That collectively necessitate them to continuously review their operating model. And where necessary, and at times, and carefully chosen to pivot or transform uh, uh, to a new model. The challenge that we have in many military organizations today in my reading and research of Ireland like New Zealand is that the changes in the past from the resulting from temporal reactions to known or perceived threats or political changes can develop that incoherence in that, that operating model. You've got small islands of capability of systems of governance around and you're not looking at a total, total whole. I believe Ireland's been presented both the opportunity and the challenge in one to commence a generational change for the future and develop a coherent direction, a coherent organization as part of a total model. The last point I'll make to you uh, is, and strangely enough, one that we, we tend to neglect or take for granted, and I've heard it, heard it 
um, again here, is that transformations require significant people buy-in to produce the human energy required to enable the organization to shift its model. So while we talk about robots and machine learning and AI being part of the future, we're fundamentally a people organization. Um, and, and transformations are fundamentally a human endeavor. We're not designing a new machine here, a new factory automated production line or process. They require, and people require an articulation. They're intelligent people. I've heard you've gone to your organization. You know, I'm serving in here for a purpose. Where's the vivid destination? that gives clear objectives, something tangible, something new, something meaningful that makes sense to me as an intelligent being that I wanna be part of this organization for the future. And that's both internal and external to the organization. And I hate to say it, but are people excited about where we're going? And this is what the human, human requires and that energy that brings the organization. Again, a plain truth, but often neglected as part of transformation strategy. And it'll make transformation uh, incredibly uh, difficult to succeed unless you build up that energy and I've heard from previous uh, people here um, prior to this of how that can slow down the organization suddenly where are we and where are we going so let me conclude transformation and the strategy to enable that shift in defense uh, and security is tough it requires foresight it requires arguing for the intangible against the tangible particularly in the uh, the environment where I want to see the results now I want it today it requires leadership that can think and act multidimensionally you know, across the, the environments, the new environments we're talking through, and we've talked about data and cyber, but also one that can think intergenerationally and build that trust and confidence and energy in the people. This multi-generational thinking must not only be from the people within the defense, but the people who make those policies can, can push that, that back, um, can push that multi-generational thinking out to the future. Now, this is always challenging in today's democracies, as I sort of quote, you know, there's always this imperative to deal with that crocodile that's right next to our canoe, rather than the one that lurks away in, into, the, into the distance. So my, 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 my question, my challenge is, what is Ireland undertaking? Are you transforming? Are you embarking on a new strategy? Are you modernizing your capabilities? Are you changing certain elements of your operating model? Maybe a reorganization, a right-sizing, or it's a little bit of all. And what is your plan to get there? To be sure, I hope you're clear, you know what you're doing. And so those who must support you internally, externally, and those that you must lead on that various change efforts are also clear of the journey they're on. In summary, I repeat, getting a true strategic vision is absolutely critical. And this will guide the development of a comprehensive strategy and a plan to realize that vision and one that is well led. These are all necessary component parts that will go a long way to assist a well-led organization achieve the change and the national policy outcomes that you're seeking. So thank you very much. And I hand it back to you, Ben. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, and I don't think I'm, I'm telling any tales out of school when I say that we have been absent a serious strategic vision on defense for generations. And that really is where we are starting seriously on the back foot in that, in that, in that enterprise. But this as I say, is, is a building block towards it. And thank you for your contribution. Uh, delighted now to turn to Ulrike. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Ben, and a wonderful good morning from me. And thank you very much for having me on this nice morning. Um, your inquiry or your research really tries to look at quite an array of important questions regarding the future of warfare and defense. Um, and so I decided rather to try to address them all to do a deep dive into the areas that I have worked on and, and studied quite intensively over the last few years. And that's unmanned systems, so-called drones, and the increasing role of artificial intelligence in warfare. And my plan is to, on both, so drones and AI, basically address two rather concrete, concrete questions. Number one, where's the development now and what are the trend lines? And then number two, what should armed forces, especially those of smaller states, invest in and do about it? And I was struck by Tim's um, uh, comment that vision is tough, change execution is tougher because it makes me almost happy to be more in the vision uh, business. But anyway, let's, let's start on, on drones. So drones, unmanned aerial vehicles, remotely piloted vehicles. Where is the development now and what are the big trend lines that are relevant for 2020, 2025 and 2030? 
Um, the first thing to note is that there has been quite some movement over the last few years, and especially really in the last two or three. So we used to have a situation where only a handful of states had armed drones. Um, for years, it was basically the US, Israel, and the UK that bought drones from the US. And we used to have the situation where drones were an exclusively military capability. Neither is true anymore today. So we've seen a significant proliferation of, of military drones, including armed drones around the world over the last few years. And the latter, this proliferation of armed drones has been driven primarily by the emergence of two new drone producer and drone exporter nations, and that's China and Turkey. Now, the interest, um, the, the, the interest in, in manufacturing drones um, by China and Turkey was driven primarily by not being able or allowed to, to um, buy drones from the United States. But by now, they really have become the main supplier of armed drones in the world. Um, China has been selling drones, for example, armed drones in, in Africa. Turkey is, is trying quite hard to get European customers. Poland um, just closed the deal. Latvia is looking into Turkish armed drones. And the US and Israel are also, I think, slowly starting to, to looking into exporting more. The French got their armed drones from the US. Germany might get, might get theirs from Israel. So to put this very clearly, we are now in a situation where any state that wants armed drones can get them through import or going down the kind of Turkish model, the Turkish route and uh, develop them yourself, build an indigenous drone manufacturing capability, which costs some money, but it's definitely possible. I also just refer to the fact that drones used to be an exclusively military technology. Um, that's no longer the case and also impacts proliferation, um, and of course, the security situation. So today, drones are being used in, in loads of different contexts, agriculture, hobbyists use drones, photography, pipeline um, inspection, everything really. And importantly for the military, these drones are coming back to the battlefield. And they're coming back to the battlefield basically in three ways. They're coming back in form of commercial drones being used by non-state actors. From Hezbollah to ISIS, we've seen this, and it's very easy to imagine European-based non-state actors or terrorist groups using these um, systems. They also come back in the form that armed forces around the world are buying commercially available systems to use. So the Dutch or the German um, Navy have, have done so. Um, and finally, because of you know, the civilian proliferation, because everyone can now get a drone and kind of tinker with it, it has just generally become easier for everyone to kind of build their own makeshift um, system. So long story, story short on this, today's battlefield and future battlefields have lots of drones in them, armed and unarmed, and we need to be prepared for this. And the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, for example, has shown that drones do not only play a role in asymmetric conflicts, as we kind of used to think, you know, Afghanistan, et cetera, but indeed in interstate conventional um, conflicts and, and uh, warfare. Another trend line for drones, I just want to throw in here, so in addition to the proliferation and the civilian rise, is the growing importance of smaller drones or even personal drones. And I think this is relevant for the kind of structure and staffing element of your inquiry, because we may go into a situation where at least among the better equipped Western militaries, individual soldiers may have their own personal drones with them at, at, um, at all time. We will also see more unmanned systems uh, on the ground, in the sea, under the sea, this is already happening, but certainly will be more of a, an effect by 2030. And indeed, the development of increasingly autonomous drones, AI-enabled systems, and drone swarms. And I'll come back to this in the section on, on AI in a second. So what should armed forces, especially smaller states armed forces, do um, and invest in when it comes to this drone uh, question? The first, most important thing, anti-drone capabilities. So no matter what you're planning, what kind of operations you want to do, you don't want to do, um, you will need anti-drone capabilities. That's very, very obvious. And there are lots of different ways to fight drones. You know, many different, there are many different drone systems, so there are many different ways to, to fight drones. It kind of ranges from kinetic solutions, basically different ways to shoot down drones, to electronics, so jamming, hacking, et cetera, microwaves, lasers, nets, even eagles, all of this has been discussed and tested and 
and, and tried out. Right now, there's a lot of investment and a lot of uh, research on this. My guess is that there won't be like the one system that will be able to fight all drones um, and, and that can do everything. So the kind of the silver bullet in anti-drone capabilities. So armed forces may need to invest in several and may need to in, uh, acquire um, all, but that's something that everyone will need to do. Do states and armed forces need drones? So am I saying, you know, given this, Ireland absolutely need to, need to get these systems? Um, so we have this, this discussion in Germany. Germany is considering buying armed drones, but we're not entire, entirely um, sure. I would say that drones have basically proven their military work. We've seen this. Um, in particular, you know, long-term surveillance, the long-term surveillance they provide is very useful. So surveillance drones, I would definitely recommend buying. Armed drones are admittedly more controversial. Um, in my view, a lot of the criticism has been a bit misplaced, but it doesn't mean that there isn't, you know, isn't any. So countries can basically decide to not get armed drones, but if that's the decision, I would definitely recommend to try and get equivalent different capabilities then. So long-term surveillance, for example, through unarmed drones to monitor and follow troops, and then also ways to engage if these troops are being attacked. This can be provided by other means, but it should then also be provided if the decision is not to acquire armed drones indeed. Let me quickly talk about, about artificial intelligence, which as I'm sure you're aware is a huge um, topic, but just to kind of throw in a few ideas that are worth thinking about in my view. So where's the development now and what are the big trend lines? Obviously AI is kind of the big hot topic at the moment in military technology. Um, there is massive interest, massive research and investment, especially in the United States and China and Raluca has referred to the kind of geopolitical competition here, but also in other places such as Russia. Europe, I would say, is a bit behind, at least in the political discussion, but you know, countries such as France and the UK are quite interested and are investing in this as well. And the thing is that AI kind of promises to change, improve, or even revolutionize all kinds of military functions. And this is really the point I, I want to emphasize here for the commission, for everyone who's watching. AI in warfare is not just about autonomy and it is not just about killer robots. That's the way it's often being portrayed. But it is equally about AI-enabled logistics, AI-enabled cyber operations, AI-enabled training, and much more. But yes, it's also about autonomy and potentially even about killer robots or lethal autonomous weapon systems, and they, as they should better be, be called. Um, and, and so we, we need to address all of these. Um, one point I wanted to mention, kind of bringing together drones and AI, and, and drones were one of the first systems and areas in which you know, AI-enabled functions did play an important role, is the, the uh, field of drone swarms, right? So drone swarms, drone swarms aren't just a lot of drones together. That would be mass drones. Our drone swarms means that drones operate together, they, com they communicate between each other, they can be used to carry out attacks together, replace each other if one or several is being shot down. So it's quite an organic um, entity and that, that capability then needs AI enabled um, capability. And there are quite a few tests of, of such drone swarms and indeed of harming such drone swarms. And there are ideas, for example, in the Franco-German-Spanish EPCAS fighter program, so the future combat air system that France, Germany and Spain are developing together. Uh, to have armed drone swarms accompany and support manned fighters. And that may require quite some level of autonomy. So, so people may not be able to control these systems as fast. And here the question arises, questions do arise regarding ethics and, and law. And, but I would argue more importantly, questions pertaining to international security as more autonomy in warfare can kind of act in a destabilizing fashion. Let me conclude with the question of, you know, what should armed forces, especially in smaller countries with limited budgets, do with this? Because this is really quite, quite huge. And what should they invest in in the realm of AI-enabled systems? I mean, the first thing I, the first point I wanna, I wanna bring across to, to this commission is that this development cannot be ignored. And I'm saying this because in Europe there is a bit of a tendency to say. AI-enabled military systems is about killer robots. We don't like killer robots, so let's just not do any of it. And that's just not good enough because 
you know, at the very least, we need to know what's what's coming and what opponents may use. Um, state needs defenses against some systems. And incidentally, in some cases, the defenses against AI-enabled, especially autonomous systems, may require some AI-enabled autonomous capabilities on your side as well. So yet another reason to kind of look into, look into um, this. There's also an interoperability question. I mean, admittedly, this is a much bigger question for NATO members than neutral states, but also within the EU, and Aidan mentioned, you know, the role of Ireland within the EU, also within the EU, there will, a question will arise of um, whether eventually there will be an interoperability problem between those forces that adopt these kind of capabilities and those forces that do not. So once more, a kind of effort to, to at least coordinate with the other allies is crucially important to kind of be up to date on what everyone is trying to do. And finally, but I'm not going to go into any details here, there are some kind of big international security questions that um, states, especially states like, like Ireland, can take on that arise here. Um, I already mentioned the lethal autonomous weapon, weapons question, but also things like you know, the potential that AI-enabled systems may undermine the nuclear um, deterrence system that our security has relied on for quite a number of years. Um, if AI-enabled surveillance and, and systems kind of undermine second strike capability, we may wake up in a wholly new world. And that's something that's definitely worth looking at even for, for um, neutral states. So I threw in a lot of thoughts and points in here to kind of give everyone some, some yeah, food for thought and I'll, I'll end here, so thank you a lot. Thanks so much, Ulrike. That is a, both a challenging and ter terrifying scenario you paint there in terms of the kinds of technological threats uh, that, now, that now face us and, and, and the limited options and the multiple options we have in trying to address and face them. Uh, Greg, over to you, sir. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation and the, the chance to talk uh, once again to Ireland about defense things. Uh, and thanks to the rest of the panelists for some really good food for thought. I'm going to avoid all of that stuff that has been covered and get straight to the point, which is, is that dealing with uh, the future, for particularly Western states like Ireland, is all about the sea. When you think about what it is that the West has uh, managed to acquire the power that it has, it's been being able to control world economics, the financial system, and all of that is linked from the fact that over the last 250 years, the West has made the rules as to how the seas work and how they've operated. Uh, how it is that we are able to survive in a just-in-time delivery system, the pandemic has exposed quite clearly. Air travel cannot replace that. And if you don't control the seas, you don't control the world. And we are very used to being able to control the world and we don't like to not. So for an island in the North Atlantic, it would only make sense, as Homer Simpson would say, duh, that it is the maritime domain that is the primary focus of what it is that you would think about in terms of any type of strategic review. And I would argue that this also speaks to all of the things that the other panelists are speaking, uh, have focused on. It used to be at one point that the, the navies and the maritime domain were the sexy topic for technological change, technological revolutions. They were the thing before the other new things came along to fascinate and titillate the, the minds of the military and policymakers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that's still the case. It is only the maritime domain that actually is the integrator of all the other domains. None of the other domains actually have to have in the modern security context, the other domains working simultaneously with it. Um, so what does that mean for Ireland? Well, I think it does mean that a number of the things that are going to be important when you're thinking about this, this strategic review is um, it does come down to some of this consideration of the future as opposed to your past. And in, in the chat room there, I saw that there was a question of, you know, you haven't had a past of a, a, a real or sophisticated or <laughs> being a, a proper state in terms of how it is that you've formulated defense thinking. That, that puts you in good company. Uh, and as a Canadian, I can say that you are right in there with the rest of the non-militaristic, easy life Western states that have relied basically on others to provide you security and haven't had to. So what do you do now? And it, it is this kind of move to the political, if you want, in the strategic level that recognizes that the world is more complex 
more dangerous, and, and it is be beholding on all states to contribute significantly to that. And that has to then trickle down into your general population. And I think the maritime discussion, particularly in Ireland, is, is the most powerful one to make. Do you really want the Brits to be looking after your subsurface submarine cables? Because they will. But do you want them to do that? Do you want them to continue to be able to guard your airspace, your coastal airspaces, which they have done, and which causes great political ferment in debate in your country, if you can't? And I think the New Zealand example is quite interesting in terms of what you've seen from a country that traditionally didn't like the idea of having to play big power games when it came to acquisition, but had to bite the pill and do it. I mean, there is no need for New Zealand to have the kind of uh, ASW maritime capability that it does if you think about New Zealand as New Zealand. But New Zealand does that to be able to connect with Australia, with the United States. It used, it used that program that Tim implemented to be able to send messages out as well as in. And I think in terms of that messaging, the maritime domain and the maritime kind of interconnectivity of the other domains is where Ireland will get its best value for money. Because all of the things that the other panelists are speaking to run square into the two kinds of, of movements that you are going to have to, to weather your way around in terms of the, the big beasts in the jungle. And there it is the Americans, you might throw in the UK here once in a while, NATO, if you think of NATO as a, a comprehensive something, I don't. I think it's broke. I think it's time is done, but it still has a number of kinds of last thrashings, if you will, of its death throes that are going to make, uh, make other countries like Ireland have to pay attention. And those are two concepts, which are the multi-domain integration, MDI, or in the UK, they call it IOPC, the integrated operational concept which is how do you fuse together all the five domains into one operational concept? You have to have this, you have to have that. Well, if you're thinking domestically, like most politicians do, how do I spend money on defense to get my maximum number of votes? All of those things speak to the, I think, the proper Irish condition, modern condition. You're educated, you want high tech jobs, you want to develop the things that are being talked about in terms of drone technology, cyber warfare, space, Okay, we all want in on the space race. We all want our GPS system. We all want, we all want. But there have to be things that you're going to have to share. So part of this thing that has been alluded to, and Tim quite clearly said, you need to think what you're wanting to do with your strategy. Which of these kinds of things do you want to be sovereign? And which do of these things, you know, for your own development, particularly, I would argue, again, in the maritime space and in this integration of how all of the domains integrate into that maritime space, and what things do you want to collaborate on? And collaboration, I think, for the, for the Irish defense strategy is a very powerful and needful tool. And that isn't just about the acquisition of technology or being able to get into the technology bed with the right players. It's about things like the old fashioned ideas and concepts that have to change now about prestige, reputation, and your value added to because right now there is a perception of what Ireland is. So how do you change that? How do you move from being, if you're going to actually change, to being something that you haven't been in the past? And operations are one of those kinds of areas that are quite important in that regard. Now, if you were a land-centric, land-domain dominated thing, you're gonna provide, and I mean, I come back to Aiden's point at the beginning, just as I do all the time with my, my Canadians, nobody is arguing about the tactical professional prowess of the armed forces. Got good soldiers, good airmen, motivated, capable. They will die the right way, in the right place, at the right time, as required by the government. Full stop. But the rest of the mechanism after that to the operational and the strategic level is badly out of line with professionalism that's shown by the Irish Defence Forces. And if those are out of, out of sync, then it doesn't matter how... You cannot keep on using tactical proficiency and professionalism examples to replace a lack of operational and strategic acumen. It just, you know, it's, you, it's smoke and mirrors of the, of the ultimate order. And I think there, the maritime, given the fact that it integrates into things like, and that are important to the domestic Irish audience, not just kinetic war fighting things, but good international citizenship, upholding of international law and norms. So when you're in the Mediterranean and doing things with migrants and refugees, yes, at the same time, being able to throw yourself into a task force into a task group and show that you've got the ability to muscle in, that you're not just a peacekeeper. 
And this is the, the differentiating thing in the, in the big jungle is who are the door kickers and who are the door holders. And if you're not one, you are the other. So where are you gonna place yourself does, does I think matter. And I think that the maritime domain gives you both the best domestic capability in terms of being able to grow the economy, do the thing you want for spending money on defense. And at the same time, it gives you the best external, which is to be able to be a good citizen, integrate with others and do the things that you wanna do. So I, I really do believe though that, that a lot of that discussion and it may be going to be taking place. It may have already taken place in a different venue, and I'm, I'm ignorant of that, and so I apologize. But all the stuff that's been talked about here is all of the buying into a vision of the future. When I came to the Defense Academy you know, in 2000, nanotechnology was what it was all about. I have yet to see anything shot down, brought down, or destroyed by nanotechnology in the combat environment. I'm not going to say that doesn't happen in other parts and other domains that maybe perhaps people don't know about or shouldn't know about. But the fact that the weaponization of nanotechnology has not produced anything of value in over 20 years should tell you just exactly how leery of some of the other snake oil sales are out there about the new technological era. And don't forget, those that sponsor those who want to talk about these things usually can find a paper trail and a money trail back to the Lockheed Martins and the Rolls Royces and all the rest. So buyer beware, I think you have to have a very good conversation like has been presented by our panelists here who have done, I think, a really good job of balance. But you need to look at that future and what's realistic and what's not within your time frame of 2035. And then that will give you a much better understanding and confidence to be able to go forward and make the kind of change that you want to do. Because without that, you know, you're just throwing darts in the dark. So thank you. That's me done, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A session to follow. Thank you very much.